Hey, what's good, people? This portion of the podcast is brought to you by Beach Volleyball National Events. Beach Volleyball National Events is the biggest get noticed beach volleyball showcase in the United States of America for juniors. We're in Florida, we're in Arizona, we're in Colorado, we're in Texas, and of course, we're in the South Bay Area in Santa Monica, Hermosa Beach, and Manhattan Beach. Beach Volleyball National Events, come play with us. It's also brought to you by NY Varsity Sports. That's me. That's me. The NYV. Watching me. Watching you. Jason DeBeas, this is Rob McLean. This is episode 31, Sports Debate Tuesday. The episode starts right now. <laughs> Ooh, I had the wrong headset on for that one. <laughs> Blow the doors off. This is episode 31, along with Rob Keeper McLean. McLean, I'm Jason Debilius. We got a pretty some pretty good subject matter because we, we've got to give the people, give the people what they want. Gonna chat a little MMA today. We're gonna chat a little NBA and we got a new subject called Quick Question. Yes or no? Of course, our favorite sports film of the week. I don't know if I'm catching Rob McLean by surprise on that, but he always seems ready for everything. But first, let's start with the NBA. Um, let's start with the Mavericks. The Mavericks against the Clippers yesterday. The Mavs, Luka Doncic dropped 41 points, 17 boards, 13 assists on the Clippers on Sunday night, including a buzzer beating three at that and overtime came back from 21 points down but that doesn't seem to be the only thing people were talking about over the weekend Rob uh, the Clippers power forward and resident rough rider uh, called Doncic a bitch ass white boy all right we're talking um god tell me this cat's name again Montrez Harrell Montrez Harrell called him a bitch ass white boy so it's kind of weird and it's kind of a touchy subject uh, for some reason. And amid amongst racial tensions in the current climate, the question was and continues to be asked, um, should, I guess, was this comment considered racist? It's, it's two part. And two, um, should Harold have apologized, which he did on Sunday, he apologized before the game. So it's a two part question. Do, um, you want to go first? Um, no, you can go first if you'd like. I um for me in basketball in, in football any sport where it's testosterone filled, uh, filled you're gonna have things people yell at you just to see if they could get you to miss you're gonna have things that are yell yelled at you because your 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 blood is boiling and that's and that's how you get yourself up and there are some athletes they 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 don't do that you see Kawhi Leonard you don't really hear a peep from the guy and then you have Montrez Harrell and you got um Draymond Green you know you got a bunch of people so the question is was this comment racist in the classic sense of the word yes racist uh racism uh, by definition means the inherent belief that someone is superior or inferior based on their race. So if you call someone a bitch ass white boy, you're suggesting that that he's, you know, if because he's white and he's a bitch, he's less than a man. So so uh, throwing a little uh, an ounce of sexism and throwing some racism and that's fine. Um, should he have apologized? Sure, if he wants to, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's listen, it's one of those things where Nobody likes me to use the term racist, Rob, because when you hear the word racist or racism, you think of something vile, you think of something evil, and you think of something disgusting that no one wants to be. But at the same time, call it what it is. I call it accepted racism because white people are not uh, a protected class because there is no systemic racism that happens that that is designed to impress oppress the white man in it in this thing and the reason why there's even a discussion period is because it's not something that white people have not heard on the court before okay I, I, I played on West Forth a little bit I played you know as, as a three sport athlete in New York City you know sooner or later you're gonna go to Rucker Park or even play in Rucker Park um, and you will hear white boy as a term of embracement. Like, oh man, that's a badass white boy. 
you know, like Larry Bird referred to, oh, that's a badass white dude. That's a badass white boy, right? Not a badass dude because it's a sport predominantly populated with African American. You're not going to say black, black, badass black dude, you know, where if it were, if it were reversed, maybe hockey, someone would be like, that's a badass brother, which is like more endearing, uh, which you won't, you're not going to say that's a badass and I and you know N word or that's a badass boy, which some people use as code a code word for for this or that, you know. So, in the context and how he used it, it's normal. It is I call it protected racist racist racism because nobody because nobody cares. <laughs> oh yes, it is, and so what? <laughs> you know that's that's what everybody's saying. But with that being said, I am glad he kind of apologized uh, because, I, for, Rob, for you and me. Like we're mulattoes, we're more uh, um, offended, we're less offended by the white boy reference than being called a bitch. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a bitch. <laughs> come treat me like one. <laughs> come, right? Come treat me like one. So, so uh, that's what uh, Max Kellerman and a lot of the people were saying this morning about that. So, uh, was the comment racist? Yes, but people have to accept racism in the classic definition and not, uh, and not as this thing. Um, where it's directed to oppress a specific race, which is the African-American in the United States of America. Uh, should he have apologized? It, I think it's a cool thing to do because in this world, if you apologize to the individual, it shows the rest of the world to get off your cancel culture bullshit. Get off your cancel culture BS where the, someone says something wrong, they have to apologize to everybody that heard it. All right, he said it to Doncic. He apologized to Doncic. Don just accepted his apology and life goes on. And I think that kind of racism thing should work both ways. Riley Cooper, I don't know if you know who he is. Riley Cooper is a wide receiver on the Eagles that was at a country Eagles. music concert was. that was calling people N words, this, N words, that, you know, N word, this, N word, that, nigga, this, nigga, that. And you know who he had to apologize? He had to, to apologize to security who accepted his apology. He had to apologize to his teammates because you play with your teammates. And if your teammates forgive you, it's probably because you had a lot, a lot of explaining to do. And, and, and after that, you got some making up to do. So I think that door should swing both ways. I think he, if, if someone says that, if they apologize and, and their apology is authentic, you accept it. And on the path to forgiveness, maybe the white side got to work on a little bit and maybe on the black side, it's, it's water under the bridge. Yeah, so, um, I mean, you hit on a lot of good points. Um, I feel like <clears throat> a lot of these comments come from a place of uh, not really, you know, they always come in the heat of the moment. You know, you, you never really see, you know, people be calling anybody anything like that on, uh, you know, on average day, you know, uh, provoked. I'm not saying he's provoked, but he's, you know, stoking himself up. He has energy himself. So I understand really that, you know, things in, in, in the heat of the moment happen, um, you know, on both sides. It's not acceptable. Um, it's, I mean, I don't know what you call white people to, to for it to be extremely racist or, you know, derogatory, you know, and that's really what, what the difference is, is um, <clears throat> yes, it's racist. Um, but it's not really derogatory, you know, bitch ass is sexist. Absolutely. But white boy is actually just his color. And, you know, if you want to call him, always oh, calling him a child. Okay. I understand that. Um, you know, it is racist. And like you're saying, it's an accepted racist term, but I don't believe any of that should be around. You know, I don't, you know, and, and the whole thing that people talk about is, well, you know, racism will always be around because it'll just be those people who do it then let those people do it. But don't allow different forms of, like you're saying, accepted racism. Like uh, when you just hear people who subconsciously, you know, check people off for certain things. Oh, you know, he, you know, this guy's so athletic, you know, but he probably won't be able to pick up concepts. And that's in every single sport, you know. Uh, oh, this guy's a certain color. So, you know, he's probably a little bit smarter than the rest of the bunch. Why? I don't know. You know, and I think like that as well. I think we all have that programmed into us to a certain extent where certain people are good at certain things. Certain races are good at certain things. But in actuality, um, most of the time, it's the culture that drives that 
um, <clears throat> that that learning or that understanding. You know, people say Asians are good at math. No, their families and cultures are very dedicated to education. You know, and education is very squarely wrapped around math. So, not to bring it away too far, but um, the whole thing, the, the whole thing about is it racist? Yes, but it's not a term that is going to, you know, uh, unfortunately it did, but it did turn heads, you know, when you hear in a, in a normal setting, you know, but it's a very heated moment. He's yelling at him. He's screaming at him. I, I get that. But, you know, he apologized and people will now say, you know, his apology is un un insincere because they forced him to apologize, which you know, he, which they, which he if, didn't. Again, you know, it doesn't matter. Even if he did, if he didn't choose to do it, people, people could say that, oh, well, he tried to, but somebody told him not to. So he did not, you know, but he really is a good guy. It's like, it doesn't matter. Like the action is really what counts. We can call the action insincere, but the fact that he did it is, is his choice, you know? So I really don't understand too much of why this happened. There's a lot that's said on, on all courts and all sports and everybody knows that. And you always try to, you know, build and grow off that. Uh, you know, I, I think that a lot of people feel bad about things they say in those situations and it's in the heat of the moment and they, they apologize. Even if they don't apologize, they may apologize, you know, through their actions and, and the way that they hold themselves from that point forward. So uh, I think for me, we have to start to let like uh, our, ourselves live these experiences, you know, and, and grow instead of, uh, you know, shunning ourselves away from uh, important chances to grow in life. You know, you, we're not going to grow off, uh, you know, everybody being amazing and happy and peaceful together because then you have no difference of opinions. So all I ask for is that people have respect. Uh, I don't feel that that is my biggest problem is I feel like he did that to disrespect him, to belittle him. Uh, that would be my biggest thing is that I believe that Montrez Harrell is much more educated and much more uh, talented in his craft of words uh, to be able to come up with something a little better than bitch ass. A little weak sauce, yeah. 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 You know, it's just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, um, you you played multiple sports before before we fell you fell in love with volleyball as did I. Uh, volleyball. Anyone that's played in New York at 145th Street with the Dominican guys, or in Central Park where you have you know my, like my our, our urban brethren, um, just on on this level we there is trash talk where people leave people want to you know if you lose you want to leave the court crying because it's like. I could take the trash talk, but I can't take it and lose to this guy at the same time. No, you know, I never hear the end of it. But the weird kind of trash talk you hear really is it starts with you attack the sport with the sport. Like volleyball, we attack volleyball players or volleyball. Montrez Harrell could have easily made that shot or whatever and been like, that's all you got. You know, he's a rookie. You know, you know, I mean, they, I guess they guess they don't play that kind of defense in Europe. You know, what I mean, and that's not even racial. I mean, that's a low racial, but that's like that's more of like a league thing. So so there's a ton of things he could have done to to um, to belittle him. He could have attacked a basketball play with basketball. And, that, you know, I'm talking you, 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 you get what I'm saying, right? Yeah, and again, I mean, he could big brother him, you know, yeah. you could, uh, you know, just like try to body the guy because I mean, they're both pretty. You know, Doncic is a pretty big guy, but Montrezl Harrell is two inches taller and 20, 20, 30 pounds bigger, you know. So yeah. it's just like you guys got to do it in a certain manner to where you can be a bully on the court physically. But, you know, verbally, I understand that. But again, there's so many much better ways to, to, to break down somebody's psyche, which mm -hmm. is really what you're trying to do. Yeah. But, you know, you're not doing it well, you know, and I think that's what Draymond Green just fell into that role of like, I'm here to break their psyche and their and their will, not to necessarily call them the nastiest names I could think of. You know what I mean? It's true. And I think that's just where, you know, playing that type of game, it's like an NFL enforcer. You know, of course, they're going to crack people and they're going to, you know, bust people up. But the second you do it the wrong way and you're trying to injure somebody, even if all the legal hits before were, were, were trying to injure him, when you try to, you know, hit somebody whose head's down, or, you know, you know, go after, you know, somebody's knee, you know, those things, it just, it's unwritten rules, you know, and I think uh, there's just certain, certain things that, you know, should be written instead yeah. of just being unwritten. And I can't, Rob, I can't emphasize enough that 
again, the majority of us, and I, and I'm, I don't mean to get on the bandwagon fallacy because I, I'm not trying to think for everybody or say what everyone's going to say, but there's not enough to be said like when you hear race, the term racism or racist as a term, you think of something vile, ugly, uh, so, someone's classless, someone's uneducated, and nobody wants to apply to here because Montre Montrez Harrell is not a vile person. He's not a contemptuous person. He's not a bitter human being. Um, I mean, I, I'm on a person. I don't know him personally, but the consensus is he's he's actually off the court. He's actually a pretty cool dude. So, so that's why people are uncomfortable um, calling it what it is. But let's not kid ourselves. The reason why this even got any heat is because there's a huge white grievance thing going on social media right now amid racial tensions, like. Um, we we see a lot of our contempt our white contemporaries and uh, some of them are not doing this but but a lot of them are doing this talking about how the media is not covering black cr crime against white white victims um that we've seen on and off on social media instagram facebook twitter and this and that and it's become it's become so ridiculous that when this hit everybody was like oh give me a break it's more of the same but uh, this is totally different than what's going on, but I, I think the reason why it's even it's even a, a conversation right now, you know, um, and I, the other thing is people need to understand the same people that are saying you shouldn't be so sensitive are the same people that will be hugely sensitive if you said something to hurt them. The same people that say, and you're going to laugh at this, Rob, uh, if you're arguing with someone, you should be able to say the one thing that's going to hurt their feelings the most, <laughs> right? If he's got one leg, screw you, you one-legged bastard, <laughs> you know? Um, but at the same time, if you attack them with something you know is going to hurt them the most, they, they ain't playing that game. They ain't throw, they not throwing bones with sticks and stones, okay? <laughs> right? So, um... It's just one of those things where it deserves its attention and, and just whether me and you are agreeing, it seems like we, we kind of agree. You, and you, I, I tap danced around, I kind of PC'd it a little bit. And you, you came, you came straight on and I'm like, oh my God, I'm so glad you said that. And you're probably like, Jay, you should have said that first. But um, I, I really love the way you put that because it's exactly how I feel. It's just, it's, it's, if you choose to do it, you have to live with the consequences, you know, uh, or what comes around you. Fair. Are unfair cool and on the basketball level rob and this is where we're going to uh, sweep into next sometimes you just need to let a sleeping tiger lie <laughs> sometimes you don't want to say somebody i mean you say these things to get people to play worse but if you say it to the wrong person they just might play a little bit better <laughs> down by 21 points the dude puts up 43 17 and 13. Big victory for the Dallas Mavericks. Now they're even at two games apiece. Um, Trey Burke uh, put up 25, helped the cause. Tim Hardaway Jr., you know, we're, we're Knicks fans, so I'm, I'm aware maybe we're Knicks fans. But um, <laughs> Tim Hardaway Jr., we know him that he's he's got a little rough rider when he, he put up 21. Lou Williams was uh, 36 points off the bench. That's pretty cool, right? Uh, and Kawhi oh. Leonard put up his 32. What's funniest, man, like watching these playoffs, mm -hmm. you, you start to realize how enjoyable basketball might be if there was like eight to 10 teams in the league instead of like 32 and, you know, half the teams can barely even make the playoffs. <laughs> or how about this? You know? How about just a 50 game season where there's more at stake? There's, you know, so this way people I aren't. Mean, People are not dragging their feet in December, you know, in November. Brother, oh, this game brother, don't mean nothing. Not a game. The they Knicks all mean something. Have no shot. The you know, let, let me just go down the list. Uh, I mean, the Bucks before Giannis were like the worst team ever. You know, like there's teams who haven't even made anything. You know, let's let's look at the Phoenix Suns. When do you think they're gonna make the next? Like honestly, when do you think they're gonna make it to the playoffs next? Not the second round, not the third round, not the championship, the playoffs. Bro, at least five teams could be nixed, and then you'd have such more potent teams as opposed to, you know, these diluted teams where some guys are going to make some money, but not really. They're going to be thrust into a life of living a certain lifestyle, and then they're not going to be able to play. They either have to go to Europe or they're going to have to learn new craft at age 35 where, you know, they lost all that time for experience in the early part of their life. 
So in, in essence, to me, what it seems like is a highway robbery. Because no, how not. much is the NFL? I mean, the NBA making on those you know trashy second you know second time little games. Uh, and uh, I, I, I don't know like, what they're making, but as a fan, uh, it's even in the bubble where you got fans watching through a monitor instead of whatever. There's still something. Else. I finally started watching like whole games. You know, because I got a lot of activity around the house and, you know, I got other duties and stuff as a coach and, mm -hmm. you know, a full time father. But um, watching some of these whole games and this just the dramatics and these, tw you know, Mavericks came back uh, they're two and two Clippers, which is a team we thought would be in the conference finals. It leads to my next question. Uh, do you think they're in trouble? You know, oh, will they win in seven or six? Just It's just an exciting time to be a basketball fan. And, and they created these conditions for a price. But good for them that, that so far, like, they're making the naysayers and the people who cling to uh, the science they understand, not the science in general, because science is always pure. It's a, uh, sometimes it's science not yet understood that makes us say, hey, let's. And they're making all of the people that said this ain't going to happen. I mean, the science says this ain't going to happen right now. You know, no, no positive test for COVID. And now they're making people say, um, you know, COVID's still a real thing, but there, there, you know, I guess there, there are ways we can still um find ways to to exist um with something i many consider a non-essential but uh just sports long list sport my dudes long list sport do, uh, I do, mean, do you see the clippers to, losing this or winning this just to touch on that last point though Please. like uh, i think you know the nba bubble should show everybody exactly what we need to do you know what i mean like on a bigger bubble, down. right? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, lock it down. Big old bubbles everywhere, you mm -hmm. know. And and I think that's what they were trying to do since day one. But you know, it's hard to, it's hard to get everybody on the same page, I guess. But are the Clippers going to win this series? Um, like I said, um, in the beginning of the playoffs, I feel as though all of these teams are planning to go to the seventh game. You know, I I feel like. And, and how, like, you know, they basically came back two weeks ago and, and, and are playing for, you know, their season. You know, that's, that's pretty crazy to me, you know, that they're basically in March and, you know, <laughs> now they're playing for everything in October. Well, I'm just saying, like, this would be the time, you know, where you feel like, okay, they're just starting to turn the curve, you know, two weeks into the season or, like, you know, just, like, just turn the curve in the season. They're going to start getting ready for, like, the long haul. And then it's like, bam, playoffs. With that being said, does Dallas can does Dallas beat the Clippers four out of seven times? Let me say this: if it doesn't go to seven, I think Dallas wins. You know, I like uh, that. you know, I think they're just gonna you know tear off the next two. Or if it starts going back and forth, it's gonna be, you know, mm -hmm. it's just the Clippers are too experienced. And they're ready for this stage, this moment. I think the Mavericks are a little early. Um, but, you know, they're a good team, yeah. tough team. You know, it's a tough first-round well, matchup. That's why you want to have that first seat. It re for me, it really depends on what we haven't talked about, the elephant in the room. Paul George came up with nine points on three of 14 shooting. I mean, this is one of those things, if he doesn't snap out of it, and that, I mean, and if Doncic Snap out can of it. He's been doing this since freaking Indiana. <laughs> No, but come on, nine points about? on three of 14 shooting. No. He'd be doing this. No. All right. Before he broke his leg, he was 50-50 doing this, you know. And then he went to, where did he go to? Uh, Oklahoma, before Oklahoma City. Did he, he was in and Oklahoma for three OKC. years? Yeah, I mean, even there, he was just like the, a guy, not the guy. And not even like the co guy. It's so know, weird the saying guy. that too, because because we remember when you know the Paul George before that. I think you he's know. just. Uh, I feel like expect like he was starting to understand his game until you know LeBron James gave him a pat on the back, and then uh, you know he kind of just was like, "I'm a superstar now," and I think that's when his uh, development started to go down, and I, I think he lost his identity as a player, broke his leg had to come back and rediscover who he is as a player. And I think that's always been lost. Like, am I a three and D guy? Am I, you know, a dribble and shoot guy? Uh, am I a defense and transition guy? Am I a rebound, you know, triple threat guy? Like I just, you know, some guys can do every, like so many things on different nights. I feel like he can do one thing great a night. 
and then he doesn't know which night is that night. You know, some guys like, oh, I'm not shooting well, I'm going to go rebound. Oh, I'm not rebounding well, I'm going to play defense. Mm -hmm. And he's just, I seem like he's lost in a high level. Agreed. He's lost, yeah, know? it definitely Kinda. needs to find himself. But Rob, at, at my common denominators, three or four, he's not three or 14 bad. <laughs> you know, I mean. He's it's... not, but I think the, 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 the big deal for me is the 14, you know, like. Look at the, you know, let's look at the shot. I'm sure it was, you know, four or five, you know, misses in between one of those miss, uh, makes. So <clears throat> for me, it's more of a shot selection thing. Like we can look at the type of shots he took. We can look at how his shooting percentage was at the time that he took those shots. And then we can look at, you know, how it looked like in the flow of the game. You know, like was it the right time? You know, could he find another guy? Like was his eyes, you know, focus on the court as well? So for me, you know, Three or fourteen says a lot more than just uh, the amount of points you score. You know? Yeah, no, no doubt. Yeah, for me, especially uh, uh, one yeah. more second is like because you also see James Harden go three for fourteen but still score twenty eight points. You know what I mean? Yes, there's so. that because they find they find ways to get to the free throw line. Exactly. You know, they find yeah they. I mean, Harden's very good at that too. He has like a terrible. He's shooting very night. good, but and, again, know yourself instead yeah. of you know jack of all trades. You know, it's a big difference. Yeah, and hey, hey, congratulations to the other teams that made um, uh, their sweep dreams come true. Right, Celtics one four zero, and um, the Raptors one four zero. And we're definitely gonna cover some more NBA on on our quick on our Q and A uh, quick thing. But for now, we gotta go. We gotta go. Shame, or nice. no shame. 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 All right, here we go. We got shame or no shame. We got three questions on that in that category. We got one minute, Mr. McLean. Rob McLean, shame or no shame. Earl Thomas gets kicked off the team, the Ravens team for personal conduct reasons. Go. Uh... I mean, got to be shame because I really wanted to see what that team that team looked like. Uh, you know, Earl is one of the best safeties of all time in my mind. Uh, in that free safety type of you know center fielder, <clears throat> pick a ball, pick a ball off. You know, kind of like Ed Reed style. So to see him in a Ravens defense would be you know crazy, and I'd love to see it. But um, yeah, you know, he's always been that that you know type of guy who has his voice and 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 will voice his opinion. So. Yeah, I got to go shame, shame, shame. One of the more tolerant teams as far as letting you be yourself, one of those teams that that, let, that allow you to let your, you, you know, let your personality come out and just be free is the Baltimore Ravens. Harbaugh is a very pretty, uh, pretty liberal coach when it comes to people doing that. And, and as long as they, they behave like adults. So if you get kicked off that team for personal conduct, you messed up. Shame, shame. Shame. Rob, shame or no shame? The Sixers losing to the Celtics four games to zero. Shame or no shame? Um, I'd have to say no shame. I think the Sixers, I mean, the, the Celtics are in a perfect roster situation for what we're, what, what, what's happening, where they can mix in a lot of players. They got a lot of talent. And they keep, uh, you know, moving around so nobody really gets too many minutes. And they're just going to be in the most fresh position. Uh, and in the 76ers, you know, they had, you know, their big guys are always injured. And, you know, they don't really have the best recording cast. And, you know, I feel bad for their coach, man. No, no, so, no. you know, no shame because they just stink, man. Yeah. Hey, I agree. Ain't no shame in losing to the Celtics right now. They've always been what, what we would call the definition of a complete, of a, of a, um, Com not constant a complete team but a consummate team well coached right all of them all of the moving parts are moving in in full swing and there's no shame to losing to that team especially if you're missing ben simmons but something tells me brett brown's not going to survive this one rob shame or no shame our third and last question roger goodell saying he should have listened earlier to kaepernick shame on goodell or shame on the NFL, or just shame on any level, shame or no shame? Uh, definitely shame. Uh, just because, and I say this a lot now about America, is like, it's just a little bit of humanitarianism, you know, a little bit of humanization in your choices, I think will go a long way because we're so focused on the dollar. We're so focused on, you know, making money. There's only so much money to be made, you know? So 
at the end of the day, I feel like you need to start choosing, you know, to make making choices to for for people to be in a better place as opposed to you know only seeing the monetary side of things no no doubt for me i gotta go shame but the the weird thing is the shame is on goodell a little bit because he said he sh you know he should have reached out to him i mean kaepernick was wearing the same face the same phone number same address but the shame really goes to the owners because goodell doesn't control um you know who who, who gets on the team and who doesn't get on the team it's it, it is the owners and the whole thing rubbed the owners the wrong way they're worried more about their brand and now that uh kaepernick is sitting pretty in this place right now it's better for their brand to actually have them try out and this and that so for me there is a shame in this but not but goodell having to fall on the sword every time because he's a commissioner i'm i'm they're gonna have to miss me on that one so shame but that's on the owners and that people concludes shame or no shame all right hey got a little a little bit more to cover on this so this subject matter is called or this portion of the podcast is called Qu quick question we're going to answer yes or no or, and if we have a sentence that that's super necessary, we make it happen. All right. Um, quick question: Should the Cowboys pick up Earl Thomas? Um, I would have to say no, just because <clears throat> the when you look at the money side of things, they put a lot of money into their defense already, and the one thing they haven't done is sign Dak long term. So only in the, in the sense that they need to make sure that they have offense because defense, honestly, for some reason, the Dallas Cowboys do such a good job at, at putting a defense on the field, whether it's, you know, the injured Sean Lee for 10 years or, you know, Demarcus Lawrence out of where, or, you know, like just the ridiculous, like Randy Gregory, like everybody said he was going to be bad. He was bad with another team. They brought him in. Boom. Like, He's he's phenomenal. Like it's it's crazy what they do with players in, in that in that. That's I, I hate the Cowboys, but you know you got to give them credit where credit is due. And offensively, they've always been trash. You know, before you know after the whole Troy Aikman and you know the Michael Johnson and all that crazy stuff. But yeah, you know, for me, they make great defense in, in in modern times. So I feel like they don't need an aging safety at the moment. Um, they should pay the players they have and they got some great players in there that can maybe float from cornerback to a safety position uh, and maybe be more effective. So, got it. Um, yeah, I think paying Dak would be better. Um, I'm going to go yes on this. And since it's a quick question thing, I'm going to consolidate my answer to um, I think this is the time the Cowboys can get him for cheap. They do have they're all strong on, on the linebacker and secondary position, but it wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't hurt to get a little bit more depth. And Earl Thomas is all but hinted when he visited Dallas when he played with Seattle. I would love to play her, you know, kind of slap Pete Carroll in the face a little bit on that. You know, but man, who you wouldn't? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and they got cool. everything there for no real. doubt. Um, do the Panthers make the playoffs? I go first on this one. The answer is no. I don't see three teams coming out of that conference. And right now you have the Saints who are still solid on offense and defense. You got the Buccaneers who are well, who Bruce Arians and Tom Brady and, and a great receiving core just on offense alone. They can beat people to the ground. And in order for the Panthers to get out of that division, I think this, they would have to have three teams and, and with, with Seattle and the Niners and, and the, the West being wild like that. Miss me on that one. The answer is no. Well, I'll keep it quick. Uh, no, because they need a lot of help on defense. Mm -hmm. Next. There it is. <laughs> Next. Pedro Munoz fought Frankie Edgar, UFC fight night over the weekend. Um, for everybody watching this event, there are good matches sprinkled left and right, but really it was just about the main event for the Frankie fans and for people who love to see someone like Muno stand in the pocket and trade and can submit you and can steal your soul. Um, Frank Yeager won by unanimous uh, by split decision. Did the judges get it right? Quick answer. Uh, yes, but you know it's because I love my man's, and I was looking at you know maybe a different side of the ring. But you know I, I you know for me it was a yes. 
For me, I got to go no. Uh, I mean, in my worst case scenario, I thought Munoz won four rounds uh, four rounds to one. In my best Frankie fan uh, uh, case scenario, Frankie won 48-47. I lost 48-47. Bottom line, I like to decide before we move on to the next question. I don't think it, anyone got screwed. It wasn't one of those things where you went to the judges and you're like, oh, this is easy. This one's easy. And they went the other way. So good fight. Oh my God. I mean, if they could survive another one of those, I'd like to see them go another one, whatever. And I, I'd also like to cite their gas tank. If if you looked at them after the fifth round, I'm like, all right, who's tired? <laughs> who wants to go round six? Right. But that's that's who we came to watch. Two guys with a, a gas tank that are impossible to finish or near impossible to finish. A uh, quick question. Will the Cleveland Browns, Nick Chubb, running back Nick Chubb, run for 1,200 plus yards this season? Uh, I say, I mean, if there is a season, I say yes, from judging from what happened last season and that they actually have a, a, a capable coach this season. Um, and, you know, just the culmination, you know, of everything coming together for, you know, their, you know, their team as they got one of the best offensive tackles in the draft. Uh, they're ready to, I feel like, you know, go to the next level, knowing that they have Nick Chubb. And they can and Baker can build off of Nick Chubb instead of the other way around. Absolutely. Yeah, I listen, I think this is gonna be one of those teams instead of using their running back to set up the the, the big throw, they're gonna use the big throw to set up the running game. I think ex, I expect them to go to, to Odell Beckham early and something in the in the receiving core. And if they get if they get so much as a three or seven point lead, watch this guy ground and pound the teams mm-hmm. to the ground. I think um if, as long as they're well coached, even if they're not well coached, I think he breaks a thousand yards. Twelve hundred is is a stretchy question. I'm gonna go with a tentative yes. Um is and question is Anthony Davis a better player, the best uh complimentary player LeBron had over D Wade and Kyrie? I'm gonna answer that first. I will say yes to uh over Kyrie, even though I thought Kyrie deserved um MVP when they won a finals MVP. Uh, but no on D Wade. So yes Thank and you. no. No, it absolutely not. Uh, D Wade is, in my opinion, a top ten all timer. Like he, he is like maybe top fifteen. You know, he is probably one of the best shooting guards, pure shooting guards, not all positions. But man, one of the best players who has never had to shoot a three point shot to have an offensive game. Like yeah. people don't understand that. Like Rodney King was really one of the last people who who like mastered the the mid range shot to such a degree that. You know, you didn't even have to shoot threes, you know, and, and, yeah. and that's like not heard of in today's game. So and then to go and win a championship on yeah. top of that, you know, I know it took Shaq, but he was one of the best players in the league in in the time of Kobe, Allen Iverson, you know, like yeah. craziness. Yeah, for um, me. Yeah, I got to go with the guy who won and finals MVP before LeBron even got there. So. So I mean Kyrie we can have a discussion about but I think what sh- what what shuts shuts the door on this thing which <clears throat> we, we we elongated this quick question but we have to we we'd yeah. be derelict in our duty if we didn't cite um um the why that's why it was important. Um last question. Who should the Timberwolves take with the number 1 pick? They got the number 1 pick in the lottery. Um I mean, I, I like this dude from 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 Georgia, uh, Anthony. Yeah, Anthony Edwards. Um, I, I just don't. I, I, <laughs> it's hard for me to say, you know, draft a, a shooting guard out of college because it's been such an up and down. I mean, even Eric Gordon, like, was one of the best coming out of college, and I still never felt like he really did his his due diligence, you know, and. Uh, so I, I, I would try to stay away from uh, him as much as I could if you found, like, a better prospect that you really fell in love with. Uh, because for me, it's like if he doesn't have a shot, then he's not a shooting guard. There you go. You know? And so, for, yeah. you know, that's, like, one of his big caveats. But, um, yeah, take a big European guy. I got to go with Ball job. if they're going to go shooting guard or scoring guard because he's been – uh, in this iron sharpens iron situation since his high school years, you know, he elected not to not to continue in college. Went to the these ridiculous leagues in Lithuania, then wound up in the Australian league, which is highly competitive. Um, they play they play some defense down down under. So a short answer: um, if if they if they got to take someone number one, I mean, it seems it seems kind of like a weak draft, but balls ball would be an easy pick for me. Cool. That's a uh, go ahead. 
No, I was just gonna say, man. Like, I don't know, man. I. I wanted Lonzo Ball to be a gr- like a great player. I think he's got all yeah. the measurables. To but they be say Lamelo's better. Amazing. Dude. Yeah, no, I mean he looked better when he was younger, but there's just something off about all of those kids, man. I'm sorry, I don't want to. I don't want to be mean, but there's just something like psychologically where, like, they're great and then they they're greedy. Like they want to be greater than great, you know. And some people have that, but like. Not three, all three of them. One of them might have it, uh, but mm, I don't see it. it's I'm sorry. Kid. I think he outgrew his, 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 own, his own position. Unless he's going to be a 6'6 point guard, I don't see it. I don't see it, man. Because only LeBron can really play that three position and be a pass first person. Like Tayshawn Prince, like he was solid, but you ain't going to draft him number one overall. I'm sorry. Yeah. Like yep. it's just, he's just not, he's not a full package. Cool, man. All right. Well, th- that's our quick Sorry. question, quick, quick answer, man. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. Listen, this is our first time doing that, man. And sometimes, you know, I mean, quick answer, people ain't going to have, you know, the feedback ain't going to be a quick answer. <laughs> um, all right. So we promised ourselves we were going to do a top five uh, mixed martial arts upsets in um, in the history of the sport. Um, it seems like most of them wound up in the UFC and you and I decided to, to um, co-op our, our things on this. So... Uh, for the people listening, Rob and I, did, we did not come to this list easy. In fact, I think we're still going to leave not agreeing with each other on a certain order of things, but we we, we, we got to swallow some of our picks. I ain't agree with some of his. He sure as hell ain't agree with some of mine. Um, even though everyone knows what our number one's going to be, it would be MMA malpractice for us to not have a, a, a total agreement on consensus. Even the MMA casuals are going to get the number one right. So, Rob, who's our, who's our number five? Upset. Uh, it would be Chris Weidman and Anderson Silva. You know, and for me, this is like really high up there, but also never be my, you know, number one, two, three, or four because it was just so disappointing. It happened so quickly. But it was such an upset because, it, you know, that feeling you got. It, honestly, the only other time I got that feeling, I was like, oh my gosh, what happened was when uh, Masvidal, you know, need Asker in the head. And it was just like, you Jeez. know, fireworks. Like, yeah. oh my God. Like, even if you man. thought he was going to win, you didn't think of like that. <laughs> right? Like, Not like I was that. like, I just want to see some, you know, blood and some, some crazy shit. Like, uh, excuse my language, oh, but it's crazy stuff happening. And, you know, nothing really happened but one big thing you know and uh same thing with Weidman and, and Silva is like man unfortunately it ended quickly but you know Weidman deserves something like that because he's had a rough career from the start and his career has not gotten any easier cool so listen my number four my number two I'm gonna keep up to your chagrin but my number four I'm gonna drop a surprise on you because I had it written down and and I decided that it's I gotta nix the rest for this one Forrest Griffin beating Shogun Maurizio Shogun Hua it was Shogun's debut when when the UFC bought pride and prior to that if you saw the Shogun's last five fights he was stealing people's soul if you go to the media and people um, have to face Shogun you never see anyone talk crap about him if you go to the, the face-offs and the weigh-ins and the face-offs you don't see people flinching and mean mugging this guy they are scared to death of this guy and when Dana White gave as far as Griffin Shogun they came up to Dana White and they said what did Forrest ever do to you <laughs> What if for what if what what, why, what what did he do to make you punish him like that? And Dana said no. When no one wanted to fight Shogun Forrest and his you know because Forrest does a little cray cray, he says I'll do it. And yeah. he weathered this storm, and then something really weird happened. This constant that constant pressure on the cage that we see that the casuals just think is cage hugging and stalling, uh, wore him down. And eventually, Forrest had the upper hand and in the third round where it looked like he was going to just ride it out on the top. Strapped in a rear naked choke, tap, tap, tap. Forrest gets his victory and subsequently gets a title shot against Rampage Jackson, that which was promised to Shogun if he won. And and if I, I remember correctly, he beat Rampage Jackson and if and uh, um I believe four rounds to one, a, a unanimous decision. So number four is Forrest Griffin over Shogun. Who's your number three? Uh, my number three has got to be uh, what did I have? Oh yeah, my Nate Diaz and uh, Conor McGregor. Um, Tell again, for me, <laughs> I think it was uh, you know the shock of how big 
you know, McGregor was getting and just that he'd been starching people, you know, for a while. Now that I know, like, now that I understand it, though, you know, you're facing a 170 coming down to 155. You know, you're 145 coming up to 155. Like, it's a big difference. And I knew that going in, but – and his power transferred. You know, he was making Nate bleed within, you know, mm-hmm. 45 seconds, you that, know. That surprised me more than anything. I don't yeah, see, that, I don't see that, 145ers, he, you know, like – cracking 170 years but you know when you do it flush you know and you have a system you know i think that's a big thing is offense is not just being great everything is about having a system um and you know you'll get clean looks and and, and most guys 145 155 you know they're not really going to be able to take those shots but nate is a different type of a fighter you know and yeah. You just got to know who you're fighting. And I, two weeks is, is perfect time for Nate to come in. And it was the worst time for, for uh, you know, Connor to <laughs> deal against a totally different type of a fighter. A different you know? reach advantage. I mean, he was supposed, oh. supposed to fight RDA, right? RDA. He yeah, had a four inch reach big advantage, lumbering guy. Who, and you could, you saw he chunked up and, and, and the wrong kind of way, you know, he was expecting a, you know, somebody to, you know, press him against the cage and, you know, he had the, you know, arm battle Have and fighting the clinch. Mm-hmm. And that was for sure what his body type looked like. And That's then it. Nate is a, you know, a slinky, you know, long, you know, reach jab, you know, hit you one, two back up. A six, you know, four it's reach. Not, yeah, yeah, it's just a totally different fight. But he fights differently as well as his, you know, reach is longer. You know, RDA, he fights smaller even, you know, than his reach is because, and it, like that seemed like a hand-picked opponent for Conor McGregor. And then he faces a guy like Nate where, you know, it's just you knew that was going to happen. Like you're not going to knock him out. You know, you're going to have to go to the ground and, and put a net rear naked choke on him. And uh, I don't think he he thought about that. And that's – I watch more and more fights. Hard to keep going. But I watch more and more fights. And the biggest neutralizer that somebody who can't, knock somebody out can do is to offensively take them down to the ground and just ground and pound but you know you got to be smart so yeah man yeah big up to connor for taking the fight too i like that i really like his anytime any place thing i'm not you know i haven't been his biggest fan but uh, it should never affect my critical thinking skills for seeing the obvious uh number two i have holly Holm um upsetting ronda rousey and it's so it's lower on some people's list and rob is shaking his head and it's lower on some people's list because if you look back retrospectively after the fact it's not that much of an upset because you examine Holly Holmes' record, you examine her reach, how she's able to use her reach, her ability to not get taken down because she has some weight on her. If you remember that match, Ronda tried to take her down with like a a, a judo flip, and then what's mm-hmm. her name just stopped it, just like locked up, just boom, like oh, that's my oh, point. What was that? You know what was that? But it's it's number two on my upset list. One, the numbers say she was a plus two thousand underdog. That's one. Two, um, and this is important. Ronda Rousey made us believers on things that we've doubted. We didn't have think she had good hands. And Edmund's like, oh, she's got great hands. And when I saw her starch Bech Cohera, uh, Cohea in Brazil, who was undefeated at the time, listen, we a lot of us got fooled. A lot of us got fooled by that. We thought that not only was she a great judo practitioner, um, she's also got these these magical hands. And if you remember, it, and this pissed me off a little bit, they were talking about she should fight Floyd Mayweather. Remember that ridiculous nonsense back in the day? So, I mean, it was one of those things that created the odds that way. They were thinking, it's time this undefeated woman, this movie star, this woman who's transcending the sport should go fight some men. <laughs> you know? When, when deep down in my heart of hearts and i'm like wait there's a woman at 145 anytime she want to move up and then crit cyborg to fight her so there's so there are a lot of people that couldn't see through the mud and i didn't know holly had everything that they said she had i just didn't know how that she would win one and how she would win I mean, I knew she can counter, but I, I didn't know Ronda's gas tank. I didn't know that she'd be doing these these front kicks. Remember that front kick? She she got her right in the jaw. I mean, she was. I mean, Edmund was trying to tell her she's doing great. Remember between round one and two, said so you're doing great. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm so, saying. I'm like, if yeah. anybody watched yeah. anything other than you know the Ronda Rousey hype train, mm-hmm. you'd realize that those wheels were never even on it. Like yeah. she couldn't throw mm-hmm. a punch. She would throw a punch and her mm-hmm. wrist would like break. 
Yeah. And I'm not, that's not a girly thing. I'm just saying she couldn't throw a punch. She, she's been in judo her whole life. You see it all like Damian Maya. I'm not mm -hmm. saying he can't throw a punch, but his punts aren't going to sting. But you can know, you appreciate been... what made people believers? Like she, she beat two, um, three undefeated uh, via KO, you know? So, um, uh, but again, in your defense, one was a wrestler, right? I mean, no, no, no. I mean, no surprise. Someone's going to have better but, hands than a wrestler. I think I honestly believe it though, is people were so afraid of the arm bar that they're looking at the arm bar and she hits you. And again, that's, that's playing the style, the, the style, mm -hmm. but maybe it's not because we never saw that going forward. You know, right. yeah. it's unfortunate she never stuck with herself. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, that's it. Hey, but we move yeah. on from now. We we disagree on that, and that's okay, right? I, I mean, I I ain't thinking Nate Diaz was an upset either, but but that was your pick. Roz, it home was and, an home, upset. And, home over Rousey was my pick. Um, and we're split down the middle on that, but where we come back together, <laughs> with love, with a long live, with a big long live sport, is what is number one, Rob? Uh, GSP and Matt Sarah. Yeah, you know it's most known and and you know biggest. I feel like when you when you felt, I mean, if you watch the fight, you kind of see GSP is a bit nervous, and and Sarah is just like always oh, a calm, cool. Even mm -hmm. if he's you know nervous, he kind of keeps that. I'm um, I'm you know chill. I'm ice. Yeah. Um, but man, I mean, you wouldn't think that GSP in all of his years, you know, started off his you know, defense with a loss to Matt Serra because he wouldn't keep distance, you know, because he tried to get inside and try to finish his guy quick when Matt Serra yeah. is a tough dude. He man. did. Like, yeah. you know, even when he did stop him, he stopped him with knees to the body when his arm, both arms are down, which is now illegal. You know, and that's what it took. Nice legal. Because this oh, guy knees is to like the body is illegal. Knees to the head is, is illegal. Knees to the body with both hands down, though. No, it's, that's legal. To the body is still illegal. Mm. Yeah, I didn't think but so. um, but you are right in a sense that George St. Pierre didn't think he'd get cracked like that. I mean, if you remember what Matt Sarah, half of his fights were at 155. He fought at 170 because he was, you know, he's in Long Island eating Italian food. So, so you know, like, yeah, I can fight at 170, no problem. So it's one of those things that George severely underestimated him because he had the reach advantage. George had the wrestling, the MMA wrestling. Right, because he we've seen George out wrestle like Division One All Americans. Josh Koshek is no joke, but there's MMA wrestling and there's wrestling wrestling. So George felt like he didn't feel threatened. He thought he had punching power, thought he had the reach, thought he had the weight advantage on a guy who naturally fights at 155, and then he gets cracked. Now he no problem. I'm back up. I'm back up. Gets cracked a second time. Gets cracked a third time. And what a lot of people for people watching this fight again, watch really closely because I I believe. He had victory uh, via TKO, but if you watch really closely, George St. Pierre, when he was getting, um, he was full mounted, like, and Sarah was like this, like a machine, boom, boom, like this. George tapped. George tapped the same time the uh, the referee stopped the fight. So for anyone listening to this podcast who's an, MM, an MMA enthusiast, you already saw it, skip it. But for people who want to watch it again, George actually tapped the strikes. It was just uh, what you were talking about, this nervousness that led to, this uh, confidence being shaken to just outright panic. I get. I need. I need a way out of this. He and and people call it the wuss's way out. But when you're in a mount like that, and you already got cracked a couple of times, there ain't no shame in tapping, man. You're. It's a checkmate position. And if the referee's not gonna stop the fight, you got. You gotta. You know. You gotta. You gotta live the fight another day. So, um, big up to him. Big. His only two losses were the two guys named Matt. Matt Sarah, and um, the first time he fought Matt Hughes. And both of those fight. Both of those. Um, Losses were avenged, and that's our top five. That's me and Rob McLean, man. It's our top five. Uh, last but not least, we're going to finish with our sports movie of the week. Don't know if you have one. <laughs> I didn't have one last the week. First. So, um, my sports movie of the week is Varsity Blues with James Banderbeck. Now, Varsity Blues is a 1999 American coming-of-age sports comedy drama film directed by Brian Robbins that follows a small-town high school football team in Texas with, their, and an, with an overbearing coach hell-bent on just winning every game. Losing is not an option as far as this guy. I believe that's uh, John Voigt. 
Uh, the players must deal with the pressures of adolescence and their football-obsessed community. Because if you've ever been in the South Bay for vo beach volleyball or indoor volleyball, it's the same thing as Texas and football. Football is not a sport. It is a way of life. And you follow it religiously. In fact, I see people, uh, they, they have billboards of themselves uh, on the property <laughs> and the position they play. That is insane, uh, Rob. So... Um, I like this movie because it's West, it's the setting is West Canaan, Texas. Football's a way of life. Losing's not an option in this top tier team, and it shows that you know how you, how people are supposed to deal with being being in this kind of football state of mind when it's not necessarily your number one priority. Like Vanderbeck, I, I believe was an academic, going to, uh, his character was going to Brown. So girlfriend, not much, not that much in the football. He became popular, was in danger of losing the girlfriend because she wasn't down with that whole big scene thing. So love the humor. Love that the teacher, you know, got caught in the in the strip joint, you know, moonlighting. They they went to a strip joint on the down low, found out their, their math teacher was dancing too. I got it bad for the teacher. Um, yeah, make mine um, varsity blues. Oh, yeah. Well, take your Texas football and I'll raise it one. I'm going to go with uh, Friday Night Lights with uh, Billy Bob Billy Thornton. Billy Bob Thornton. Yeah. I mean, that movie was such a great insight to what uh, people like what nobody really knows about in juniors football, about how just demanding it is and, and what they have to go through and, and, and how you watch them you know, run into each other night after night on, on, on the pro level, which is after 20 years of training to get there. And they're super willing to do that. And, you know, their bodies seem almost hardened. And there's a reason why, because they spend three days in burning heat, uh, you know, 100 degree weather to practice their skills. And, yeah. I, you know, that dedication is not seen in many, in many sports because the demand is, isn't really there for that. So crazy to see just what those kids go through and then most of them don't even make it to college you know and play college ball you know and if they make it a college ball most of them don't make it to pros you know and if they make it a pros they don't make it most of them don't make it to the nfl so and they do acknowledge that this is uh they're fed by their family and their coaches this is the highlight of your life <laughs> right because you're not you know something you're right. A lot of them are not going to go to college. A lot of them are not going to go to the NFL. So they're like, this is your one time to be great. You have the rest of your life to be mediocre. And that's that's mm -hmm. the emphasis. Wow. You know, boy, did we boy, did we go two way on this. That 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 kind of uh, that place is religion on football. That place mm -hmm. is probably right now saying COVID can go to hell. You know, high school, you know, they could go to hell too. But we we playing football. We, at the, we, it, we, yeah. willing, we are willing to risk our lives, the lives of the people in our town. Uh, and all of them, <laughs> you know, I mean, collectively accept that. Assume and accept that risk, which is insane. Yeah. Right. Hey, I think uh, just because right. I wanted to close with just the fact that I feel like that has a lot to do with culture. You know, like we were talking before with the Montrez Herald, you know, uh, football is definitely part of American culture. And if you want to talk in reality, uh, in, in racial terms, that it's was a white man's sport for a very long time, you know, yeah. before they allowed black people to play. Particularly you know, quarterback. Yeah, particularly quarterback. And it's even still to this day, it's still uh, an iffy subject. You yeah. Know, so, Come on. Ain't, ain't nobody going to look at look at. um. Hook uh, Lamar Jackson and be like, damn, not bad for a black guy. <laughs> you know? right? So again, just, you know, acceptable like, just, racism. It's, it's just very interesting. You know, same thing with tennis, same thing with golf, same thing for a mm -hmm. lot of sports, you know, uh, sail, sailing and, you know, all these different types of sports. Um, you know, I think it comes into a culture where a lot of people are raised in love and happiness and some people are raised in exclusion. So, mm -hmm. you know, Keep your eyes open and keep trying to find love for people and not, you know, whatever it is your perspective is on things. I love it because we just consolidated that and our shout out before we wrap up today. Exactly. That's all I got. That's all you got, Rob? 
That's all I got. Listen, people, Rob McLean may love you, but me, I have had enough of you, all right? For all of you at home on your desktop who who rules the world, old school, old school. For everybody on their iPad, might look like, like this. For everybody on their iPhone or their droid. For Rob, keep it McLean. McLean, this is episode 31 of Sports Debate Tuesday, and we say we're out. Come check out the Option Podcast on OptionDB.com. It's also available on iTunes and Spotify and on YouTube under the NY Varsity Sports Angel. You're going to love what you hear.